Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this beautiful morning, kind of uh, worshiping the sun, actually. You should be outside and take advantage of that. Um, well, I'll give you a tour, a long history, a very patchy thing, but uh, just to realize how important the sun is. We take it for granted today, but people didn't in the past. He was the main god. Beautiful is your rising in the horizon of heaven. You, living sun. You who were first at the beginning of things. You are far away, but your rays reach the lands to the very limits of all what you have created. Of all what you have created. You are beautiful and great and shining. This is how one of the Egyptian pharaohs, Akhenaten, welcomes the sun in the sky every morning. Beautiful poem, the hymn to the sun. And you see in those uh, times the first monotheistic, monotheistic religion in the world actually worshiping the sun. And you always see the sun with rays doing this beneficial uh, action towards humankind. All these beautiful uh, pieces of work that we have there with the sun rays coming into humankind, into our landscapes, into all different creatures that we have. I take this uh, particular tablet which is shows the sun, you know, the sun, when you see the disc on top of the characters, that is the sun god. This is Rahurakti sending a beautiful shower of flowers, of lilies. Beautiful, poetic way of describing the energy of the sun that we get every day. And they knew how important the sun is. It's a beautiful thing. You can actually see it in Louvre Museum in Paris. It's a lovely tablet about this big, beautiful thing. So what is the sun? Which other cultures were actually worshipping the sun? We know the sun is very important. The light of the sun gives us food, gives us atmosphere, gives us so many things. And people know this uh, from the, from the uh, thousands of years in the back. So if we go to South America, this is when it was discovered, uh, probably uh, about 100 years ago or so, the Gate of the Sun in Tiwanaku. This is the Inca culture. Inti is the name of the sun. And it's depicted here in this uh, beautiful frame that was broken during the uh, excavations, I think. And then finally, we see it today as, as it is. Uh, just in a beautiful place with no clouds, as you, as you see there. Associated with gold. The golden disk of the sun and the gold that was very abundant in, uh, in this part of, of, uh, of uh, uh, America and in all the places in the world. This comes from Ireland. And we have these amazing pieces of art always describing the sun in a very <coughs> symbolic, in a very, um, this is a mask, in a very, uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, the most valuable thing, gold and the sun. So if we go now to my country in Mexico, Teotihuacan, which is the city of the, of the gods, the place of the gods, where the largest pyramid in the background is the large, one of the largest structures ever built on this planet. By volume, I think it's larger than the pyramids in, in Egypt. And uh, it is, uh, uh, I mean, you see people here somewhere. This is really a huge, a huge monument. The main pyramid, the pyramid of the sun. There is the pyramid of the moon as well. So a huge monument, and the Aztecs have the Aztec calendar. It's not exactly a calendar. It's the sunstone with Tonatiu, the sun god, in the center. And two snakes here, rattlesnakes. There are rattlesnakes in Mexico, and they are facing each other. A lot of symbolisms here, the four suns and the fifth sun. There's a lot of religion. The creative power, that's the point. The sun is a creative power. Akhenaten says, and I repeat that twice, all what you have created, the sun is the creator for them. And this is the sunstone, the original one, which is a huge thing, as you can see here, the scale is, is, is actually, it's about the size of this wall. Okay, it's a big, a big uh, monolith made out of uh, basalt. Very difficult to, to, to carve that in a single piece of stone. Amazing thing in, in the Anthropology Museum in Mexico. This myth comes from uh, uh, North America. And it says, in the beginning, there were only two, Tawa, the sun god, and the spider woman, the earth goddess. 
And again, the sun and the earth are having a, an interplay here to create uh, the, the entire, the entire uh, universe, in a way, the, the, the sun, the creator. Now, if we go back to um, Egypt and we take part of one of these broken pieces of the sun with the rays there, and we remember what we just described as the uh, giver of uh, uh, energy, and also in the tombs, this is a picture I took myself in, uh, in one of the tombs in, uh, in, uh, in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, when we see the key of eternity and this person is going to die, or, and then we have the sun, God giving that, with the red disc, you see the red disc everywhere on top of different gods, different gods with uh, different heads of uh, different animals. And uh, I like this one especially because when we look at our sacred images of the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus, we have the same thing. You see the sun is above their heads and behind her we see the rays of the sun very similar that Christianity has borrowed from the Egyptians this beautiful representation in a different way. So, what else can do the sun for us? That thing that we see in the sky, especially in a day like today. So, we have fear that that thing in the sky is going to disappear, and it does. And there are anecdotes of the sun disappearing in the middle of the day. This is a battle that took place in the Middle East some ages ago, I, could, I wish it was an eclipse today, and people will start killing each other, because that's what happened there, because uh, they were battling, and the sun disappeared in the middle of the day for no reason at all. I mean, no physical reason at all, and they, they stopped battling, and they signed an armistice. So we have an eclipse there, I wonder if, uh, who knows? So, but this eclipse, the uh, disappearance of the sun during the day, has been taken by other cultures, where there is a, a cosmic monster that will come and eat the sun away, like the god Rahu in the Indian culture. He, was, uh, he wanted to get eternal life, and he uh, disguised himself as a woman, and then went to the banquet of the gods, and then started drinking the magic potion that would give him eternal life. And then he was discovered, he was caught by Vishnu, and then Vishnu chops his head off, uh, and then throw the head of, the, of, of, uh, of uh, Rahu in the sky. And since then, Rahu just wanders in the sky, eating the sun and the moon every now and then, making them disappear like this in, uh, uh, in the sky. And uh, here uh, we have uh, well, a couple of images of that thing happening, which is terrifying in a way, especially when we see it like this, when the sun disappears and then we see this, well, kind of very threatening kind of eye, like the eye of God, which is going to punish us. And uh, in the eyes of these people in the ancient times, it was a terrifying thing to see. Even today, people see these things and they are terrified, and we admire it. And then we travel long distances, actually. We were talking about that just now, to witness the, the, one of the most uh, impressive uh, uh, displays of nature. But it was terrifying at the time, and you can see Ragu in the, in the British Museum in London, uh, carrying pieces of the sun and the moon, having eaten them. So what else? The sun in Stonehenge. The sun in Stonehenge is uh, very important because uh, Stonehenge, well, who knows? It's a computer, it is a, a very ancient monument built along thousands of years with huge stones. And then what's the reason to do that? You know? And we see that uh, these are Google images from, seen from, uh, from space. But we know that Stonehenge has an alignment, and that alignment is very clear here. You see the avenue here, and the angle is about uh, 50 degrees. And that angle is very important. That's the hill stone here. And if we are pointing towards the hill stone along that avenue, if we wait along the year, this will be uh, towards the uh, end of the uh, winter, spring, and then we wait, we see the sun rising, closer to the uh, beginning of the summer, and at the solstice on the 21st or 22nd of June, the sun will rise exactly in that alignment, and there will be literally thousands of people there trying to watch that uh, on that morning. So it is a calendar. So that happens every, every year, and uh, it has been happening for thousands of years. There are other alignments in the tombs in Ireland, in uh, Scotland, in, uh, in the... Uh, Orkney Islands, 
there are places where the sun, the alignment of the sun in these tombs is perfect. At the time of the solstice, there's either the summer solstice or the winter solstice. This is New Grange in Ireland, where the winter solstice uh, sun will come all the way inside this tomb and illuminate all the way inside. So, another part of the sun, well, the importance of the sun is that it goes along the sky, the sun, the planets, and the moon go along the sky in a particular part of the sky. We have here constellations, the figures of the constellations. We have Ursa Major, we have, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, Cetus, we have uh, uh, the river Ididinus here, Orion and unicorn, uh, and then in white we have the constellations of the zodiac. The constellations of the zodiac are very important because that, those are the constellations where we see the sun, we see the moon, and we see the planet. And that was the origin of the, uh, this uh, kind of disarray that we see in the sky. All the stars are always in the same place, but these, pl these objects move, the planets move all the time, and that was a, a major mystery. And that was the birth of astrology, probably, uh, I don't know, 3,000 years ago, somewhere in Mesopotamia. And we have these constellations here, and the origin of astrology comes from those movements of the sun in the sky as well. And uh, depending on where the sun is in the sky, if you are born in that uh, uh, time, you will uh, have a horoscope, something like this, a chart like this. And here you have a different kinds of uh, possibilities in your life so about uh, all these things. This is just a, a random... Uh, selection of, uh, of things. I just put here what I read in these little cases, which are called the houses of, uh, anyway, it's all a whole thing. I mean, still people believe today these things and, uh, and buy the newspapers or consult the internet uh, for horoscopes, believing that the stars affect our lives, and not knowing that the stars affect our lives, actually, because they do. And you will see in the, in the rest of the day that uh, how the, the stars affect our, our lives. So in such a much a physical and chemical way, much more beautiful than all these things that we see. In the, before I finish with this, in the, in the Middle Ages, there was a medical astrology where each of the constellations of the zodiac is going to affect different parts of the body. So depending on your astrological sign or constellation, uh, you have an illness, you will be affecting your arms, if Gemini is the arms, I think, yeah? And then you have fish, the feet, etc. It's, it's a quite an interesting, an interesting thing to see. But what is the sun? What is the sun? This thing what we see in this guy. What is it? It was Anaxagoras. We are now going uh, 500 years BCE, which is more than 2000, 2500 years ago. What is the sun? Anaxagoras said the sun may be a star. And at that time, there is no telescope, there is no uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of really, it's just intuition, you see. There's no way of, of proving anything. It's just an intuition that the sun may be a star. And that is the first record, as, as far as I know, of, in history of uh, someone really uh, uh, saying that and publishing it. Later on, Aristarchus, as we know, Aristarchus had a, a very clever man. He had a model of the, of the solar system where the sun was at the center, a heliocentric model of the, of the solar system that predates for uh, uh, nearly 2,000 years predates uh, uh, Copernicus. And he also said, he did a lot of calculations. <coughs> he was calculating the distance to the sun, the distance to the moon, the size of the moon, all these things in, with very simple <coughs> geometry. Remember, there is no telescope. There is no big technology there. Only, the only tool was very primitive mathematics and geometry that they have already in Greece at the time. And again, the sun is a star. How do you prove that? How can you prove that the sun is a star? Well, we go uh, a few uh, hundred years ahead. We are in the uh, year uh, 1500s after Copernicus. We're going to see Copernicus later on today. And this character, Giovanni Bruno, is uh, another very important philosopher that comes just before the telescope. Just before. And he said many things. He's the father of modern philosophy. And he said that. Uh, there will be an infinite number of worlds out there, that the sun is like a star, so the stars, as the sun, may have planets around them, and there will be an infinite number of planets like our own. And for this and other things that he said, this is a, a, a bronze uh, a plaque that is in his monument in, uh, in, in Rome. He was uh, 
uh, captured by the Inquisition in Rome in, uh, in the year uh, 1593. He was tortured for seven years, and finally he was born at the stake in that very place there that you can visit in, the, in February 1600. One of the most important minds of this planet ever. And uh, he's the father of modern philosophy. He did a lot of advances in many areas of, of mental thought, and many philosophers have followed his, his thoughts. <coughs> so the sun is a star. How are we going to do that? We have to wait for the telescope. And this is the telescope we have in Mill Hill and the observatory in North London. You're very welcome to, to visit. Just contact me, and we can organize a visit. We have five major domes. This is our oldest telescope. We call it the Frey Telescope. It's in uh, 1862. And 20 years earlier, Wilhelm Bessel in Germany, using a telescope very similar to this one, managed to measure the distances to the stars. How do you measure the distances to the stars? How do you think you measure the distances to the stars? You take a ruler. We know that the Earth is moving around the Sun. It's going around the Sun every year. So our perspective to the stars is changing all the time, as it is doing now. I can see you moving like this. You in the back, you move very little. So I can judge with my eyes what is the three-dimensional projection here. That's exactly what Bessel did. Looking at stars that are close, there are reasons to, to select the stars which are close. You know how far they are, but the stars are apparently move faster. You know, all the stars are moving because they are ro rotating around the galaxy. And they move, and the ones that move faster, they were thought to be the ones which are closer. And it's true. So they chose one of those stars, Bessel chose one of those stars, and followed for several years, and came to the conclusion that the stars are of the order. It's very simple trigonometry, actually, measuring the orbit of the Earth and the angle that you see the stars. The stars actually shift the same as you're shifting. You can do that with your eyes. You do this. You can see the, 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 the movements of your... It's called parallax, yeah? A million times. A million times farther than the Sun. That's far. Immediately, you say, you take the Sun, and you take it a million times farther away at the same distance to the stars, and the sun becomes that. That proves that the power of the sun and the power of the stars is similar. <coughs> they have the same energy. They have the same power. The sun is a star. There are other ways of also uh, proving that the sun is a star, more sophisticated, but this is a very simple demonstration. The sun is a star. The sun god, the beautiful thing that we see in the sky, take it that far away as the average stars in this picture, and then it becomes a minute star, because it's not even a big star. It's just a small star. It's a dwarf star. And we'll see that more uh, in the rest of the day today. So. I bring you the Genesis, the uh, chapter 1 of the Genesis, with the chapters, with the paragraphs 16, 17, 18, and 19, taken from St. James' Bible, exactly as it is in the version I found. And it says, And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Just like, by the way, he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So there were three days without sun. And they are called days. Interesting. So uh, we move a little bit more now, and we are going to finish with this uh, uh, kind of bringing the sun in our culture. 
We have some, I think it was about 60 flags in, in, in the world. There are flags that have the sun. These are only a few of them. Argentina, Uruguay, Japan, etc. And it is interesting to see the sun. It's beautiful to actually to have the sun in your flag. It's a beautiful thing to have. And if you remember this uh, installation in the Tate Modern a few years back, one of the Swedish uh, artists created the sun, which is, was very clever. He just half of the sun here with uh, yellow lights in the background, and the rest is a mirror. It's a mirror in the roof, and in the distance, the sun is in the wall, the mirror is reflected the other half, and you see the distortion here by the mirrors, and it was magic. It was a, an amazing experience. You see the mirror here reflecting people on the, on the deck. That was a beautiful way of representing the sun. Like a, it was like a feeling like a Japanese garden. And yes, we have the sun and the stars. Now, what's the difference? Doesn't matter. Uh, painted by, by children, painted by Van Gogh in this case, in Plau, uh, somewhere in, a, in, in, in Holland. And I want to bring this one here because it shows the goddess Lut. The goddess Nut for the Egyptians is the goddess of the sky. Her naked body will come every night decorated with stars to fill our sky with beautiful lights. And I like that representation. And uh, also this one from the little prince that lives in an asteroid. And that asteroid symbolizes our own planet, of course, with flowers, with volcanoes. And the little prince is very busy. Uh, tidying up his asteroid and keeping the volcanoes erupting and the flowers water and all that and taking away the weeds because he wants to take care of his planet. And we look at the stars and we look at the sun here as well. Very important. Thank you very much. today is just as beautiful as many of the things you've shown, so I'm honored to see if there are any questions um, to that. So, um, do we have any questions, or if you could just wait for the microphone first? Yeah, yes, yes. I, yeah. They know where it was. Yeah. Even though we take it for granted in cycling. Yeah, you cannot see the sun where it is in the yeah. day, in the daytime. Yeah. You have to take yeah. the position on it. Um, is there any evidence of when it came from? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
and there is a replica. There is a replica, I suppose, in the British Museum. I'm not sure. There is a replica in the Science Museum. In the Science Museum. The tender stone. <laughs> and it has all the constellations. It has Orion as well. It has uh, uh, but the, the constellation of the Zodiac. And in some of the, I remember some of the sarcophagus in, in, uh, in, uh, in the British Museum, they show the constellation of the Zodiac as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's fascinating. 12 only, not 13. It should be 13. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, the Oh, sorry, yeah, thinking of that. I was going to ask, um, what is the link between the Tutuakan and the temple of the sun? And the actual sun. Oh, the link? Well, it's not the temple of the sun. It's a secret because it's the, the, the sun the stone is the, is the sun itself. They worship the sun all the time, and they have the sun coming and going in cycles. It's the first sun, the second sun, the, the fourth sun, and the fifth sun. And they are sacrifices, uh, on a particular the calendar of, of the Aztecs is very accurate. It's far more accurate than the than the any calendar uh, in Europe at the time. They have 360 days of uh, of uh, of uh, say a certain number of number of days in the year plus five days of the ceremony when they will do sacrifices and, and worship the sun. Yeah, in that place in Teotihuacan. Yeah, it's a very gruesome <coughs> description of how they take. Uh, I mean, prisoners and uh, sacrificing. And they are very willing to be sacrificed as well. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, shocking for the European culture. Although what we can see later on is not that shocking in that respect. And right there, that was nothing that we could do, which was uh, comparable to what we do today in the world. Thank you very much. Why did that get lost? Yes, exactly. It's uh, Aristarchus. There are records of Aristarchus uh, in the century of the system, and it was lost. Um, well, the Library of Alexandria was burned in the year 600 or something, 600 or something. And some of these uh, works were lost with many other wealth of information, and a uh, piece of art and science were, were burned in, in, in that fire. And I don't know if I start this work with Bernard as well, but we know that uh, he had this model. I don't know if Copernicus took that, this is controversy there, if Copernicus took that idea and realized that the heliocentric model of the, of the universe, say, at that time, was uh, a simpler way to explain the movements of the planets, which wasn't, because the, the, uh, the Ptolemy model with the epicycles was more accurate. But uh, because, because Copernicus is using uh, circular orbit, and it was Kepler that came later on with the elliptical orbits, and that everything had to play, but it was a, a, a big lecture. But yes, it's, a, it's very, uh, not very clear why this amazing piece of work was lost or ignored or forgotten. It could be religious things, you know, uh, the same as Copernicus had, you know, he couldn't publish, he refused to publish in his lifetime his ideas of the of revolutions of the, of the celestial orbits because he knew that he was going to be persecuted the same as later on the Orlando of Galileo himself was also persecuted for advocating a, a heliocentric model of the, of, the, of, the, of the universe. So perhaps Aristarchus was kind of uh, made in the black list of, I don't know, this uh, interesting, but he was very certain he was very to write <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Francisco. That was fascinating. Um, some of the very earliest uh, observations were by the ancient Chinese. I think the earliest recorded eclipses more than 4,000 years ago. And they actually got the stage for the predicted eclipses. And they also made other observations, as you know, supernovae and comets and so on. So they're fairly sophisticated. But the conventional a uh, picture of the Chinese understanding of eclipses was that a dragon was swallowing the sun. Oh, yeah. Now, do you think that they actually thought that, or whether that was just a way of perhaps keeping the, the knowledge secret from the general public? No, no, I think, the, no, well, I don't know. Um, uh, if they knew we got the moon coming in front of the sun, uh, I don't know. I mean, this idea of a uh, ragu from the Indian Sea with the Chinese would be a dragon for the Maya and the, uh, the 
project in Central America was of course with Jaguar, which is the local beasts that you have there. So uh, they were uh, the, the eating some away. But uh, yes, there is a very famous anecdote of these two Chinese astronomers that failed to predict and fail, and they were executed. Yeah, so we have to be careful with all the <laughs> questions. <laughs> So yeah. you think they genuinely thought it was a dragon? I, I well, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I prefer to think that way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> without any, without any reason, really. <laughs>